My name is uh, Chris Clark. I'm senior curator at the Glucksman in University College Cork, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's panel discussion um, on digital art in Ireland. Um, digital Art in Ireland is a collection of essays published by Anthem Press, which examines how new media technologies are shaping the island's contemporary artistic practices. As one of the first dedicated culture-specific treatments of Irish digital art, it fills a major gap in the national media archaeology of Ireland, engaging with a range of topics, including electronic literature, video games, and the data city. And on the occasion of its launch, um, Sample Studios, in partnership with University College Cork Department of Digital Humanities, is very pleased to welcome a panel discussion with invited contributors, L. Putnam, Karen Nolan, and Connor McGarrickle. Uh, James O'Sullivan, who edited uh, Digital Art in Ireland, uh, also wanted me to pass on uh, his sincerest thanks to each of the contributors to Digital Art in Ireland for their wonderful chapters and to Anthem Press for publishing the book. Um, he also says it's available now in hardback which is expensive as academic texts tend to be, but while waiting for the paperback, you can either get a copy from the Pool Library in UCC, or you can pop James an email and you find his details online. Uh, very generous of him uh, to pass those on. Uh, and he'll be happy to send you any materials you might be looking for. Um, so to get things uh, rolling here, um, as mentioned, there's three presentations today uh, by Connor McGarrickle, Kieran Nolan, and L. Putnam. Um, each presenter will um, speak for about 15 minutes uh, on their practice um, and on their essay. Um, and then we will have a follow-up period uh, following all the presentations with a chance to ask some questions and engage in a discussion. And you'll be able to do that through the Q&A function um, or the chat function on your Zoom uh, page. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to welcome uh, Connor McGarrickle to lead off this session. Uh, Connor is an artist and researcher working primarily with digital media. This practice is characterized by urban interventions mediated through digital technologies and data-driven explorations of network social practices. He's a lecturer in fine art new media at the TU Dublin School of Creative Arts and a research fellow of the Graduate School of Creative Arts and Media. He has exhibited extensively internationally, including the Venice Biennale, the Fondation Miro Mallorca, the Saint Etienne Biennial, uh, Site Santa Fe and the Science Gallery in Dublin. So I'm very pleased to welcome uh, you, Connor, and happy to hand over um, for your presentation. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Chris. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Let's just start off. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to thank everyone, Sample Studios, Evie and Michael, uh, thank uh, uh, particularly James for putting this book together. It's a really important book. Uh, particularly because digital arts has been traditionally the, the kind of the, the Cinderella, I guess, of the Irish art scene. Uh, and I'm going to share my screen now for, for my notes. So let's see, does this work? Uh, okay, so what, what I want to do, and it's great as well to be on this panel with, with, with such a, an amazing collection of artists and, uh, and speakers. So my talk is going to be in two parts. Uh, the first is going to be about the ideas behind the chapter, and the second on an individual work that's discussed in it. Uh, so what I do is I start with this question about big data and the city. So what I wanted to ask was, what is it that makes them of particular relevance at this moment? And then there was a secondary question of where digital art practice, which has traditionally been this critical voice on social impacts of technology, and where does that fit in the picture? Uh, for me, this journey begins with the city at what I believe is a moment of emergence. That is that complex, pervasive computational systems are changing the nature uh, and the practice of urban space itself. Uh, and that extensive data assemblages are coming into being uh, and that these can capture almost every digitally mediated action, which in these days is pretty much everything, from the mundane to the most profound in unimaginable granularity. And, and that, that these data are then being used to model and predict behavior, resulting in complex and, and unpredictable outcomes. And these are images of uh, facial recognition and uh, machine learning at, at operation in operation, as well as like self how self-driving cars see the see the world. 
So this moment, this development uh, has been described as surveillance capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff, the author. But the interaction of human and non-human actors has always produced the space of the city. You know, and these pictures from the early days of the telephone kind of give you a sense of that. Uh, but I suggest that the digital revolution has changed the nature and the extent of these interactions. Uh, and that what might be called the data revolution is now rendering it all as data. So that even though collecting information on, on city residents has always been central to the management and governance of cities, that the scale of, of these data and their use in machine learning and artificial intelligence systems uh, to model and predict behavior represents what I see as an epistemic shift, not just a difference in scale. Uh, so think, for example, of uh, traffic in Google Maps, uh, the way that it can predict traffic jams up ahead of you based on, on the movement of devices in real time, the fact that your phone is moving at a certain speed surrounded by other phones moving at different speeds. Uh, and this, of course, is supported by predictive modeling based on vast stores of accumulated data uh, uh, of location and movements and things like that. So this is for something very different than we've had before. And of course, it's a truism to say that we increasingly live in smart cities. Uh, cities that are entangled in networks, enmeshed in sensor networks, coded infrastructure, almost everything, every activity producing data in some way, which and then that's in turn been fed back into complex network assemblages of digital technologies, ICT infrastructure uh, that manage urban systems and can be thought of producing the space of the city automatically. Uh, and what I mean by that is that they automate the function or governance of urban spaces, impacting how they're used uh, and how they can be used. In parallel to these systems of, of city management, we can add a much more comprehensive and all-encompassing layer. Uh, and that is something that extracts data for Silicon Valley, the big corporations in Silicon Valley. And that's ubiquitous network, location aware, socially connected mobile devices that we all have. Uh, in, yeah, sorry. Uh, recent, yeah, so recent research in Trinity's Connect Center actually has shown that Apple and Android phones transfer data home every four and a half minutes, even when they're not being in use. Uh, so social networks can also be thought of acting uh, as social sensors. That is that they provide this kind of fast moving, thick description of the city as a lived space and how we use it, what we do in the space. And this can be analyzed for sentiment using algorithmic techniques, uh, even to the level of emotion detection uh, using facial recognition uh, and based on a, a very dubious science. Uh, and these are all added to individualized data uh, available from, from all sorts of different sources to build these rich uh, personal profiles of each and every one of us. I think the recent Google Sidewalks Lab, and this was a proposal uh, for the development of a neighborhood in, in Keyside in Toronto in Canada, is particularly relevant because it was the first really concrete example of a proposal that envisaged building a city neighborhood as a site for data extraction uh, at scale. Uh, and then recent patterns fr from Google indicate the scale of the data collection envisaged. So this is one that monitors children's behavior based on ambient sounds in the house. And there's even one that claims to detect that uh, if children are brushing their teeth correctly for the correct duration and all that. Uh, so this is data at, at a very, very granular level. And this has led to a growing concern that the, that the opacity of these co coded infrastructures, their, their black box nature, leads to a lack of civic oversight. There's an inability to understand, to critique and refine their assumptions. Uh, and this results in algorithmic discrimination. And these are just a small selection of some of, of the, the scholarship that's being, being done about this at the moment. Uh, so we're left in this position that, that we, we, we realize that we need new methods of calling attention to the expression of algorithmic processes uh, that can make these consequences evident. And what I'm suggesting in this chapter is that digital art is one such method. So for the second part of this talk, I want to talk about a particular work 
and it's discussed in the chapter and it's a work called 24 hour social it's a work of mine from 2014 to 2016 it kind of developed over time uh, so i just want to talk about this and and this project occupied what i see as the quasi public space of social of a social media platform called vine the vine no longer exists but it was a, a platform for creation and sharing of six, seven loop, six second loop videos. It's very much a precursor of TikTok, uh, which you probably know. What was interesting for me was that Vine was a mobile only platform. Uh, so it existed between, uh, and these are some, okay, our pictures look, look weird, but some of the images of Vine in its early days are kind of on the thing. And actually something missing from that slide, so apologies for that. Uh, so it exists between the materiality of actions enacted for video, the actual performing for video, and then the personalized and intimate space of the smartphone. So this was a kind of a first generation surveillance capitalist platform. It was explicitly built to collect data on its users. And it generated, oh, sorry, there we go. Uh, and it generated, uh, it generated kind of uh, attention from, uh, I guess the attention of the users to, to the video itself, but, but also is collecting data on the users itself. So the work itself was, I see it as a data project. Uh, so what it did was it, it built this kind of what I see as a, a, a type of imminent critique of the video sharing platform using its own data. So the form, the actual form of the project itself is it, it, it's a, a generative, multi-channel generative video installation. That is that video images and, and data extracted from the platform are algorithmically generated in real time from a much larger database with the exact form and the content of the work variable with every iteration controlled by the algorithm. It's a durational work. And I'm gonna just play a video here. I'm gonna try and mute the sound so I can talk over it. And this is kind of an overview of, of the project itself. So it's a durational work. So it has a full running time of 24 hours. Over the time, it shows a Vine video for every second of the day. It shows 86,400 in total. And each video has been shown at the exact time of its original creation, a, 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 synced by an algorithm. It, it shows both the Vine videos uh, and then a continually kind of wall of updated metadata. That's data about each video and the context of its creation and the related network activity. Uh, so in a social media platform like Vine, metadata is hidden from view, but, but it is in effect the fuel that drives the algorithms that govern the platform. And in a very real way, it's the purpose. It's the point of the platform in the first place. So this work is an algorithmic repurposing of the appropriated content. Uh, it, it, what it does is in fact, it recontextualizes the Vine videos to coded processes to present this portrait of social media as a kind of always on relentless torrent of data, a kind of a social media fueled version of uh, Vertov's man with a movie camera, perhaps, uh, capturing the unfolding day across the internet with the editorial hand algorithmically replaced. So this view is simultaneously a making visible of the corporate algorithmic processes uh, that track and monitor and capture everyday life and the critical intervention by means of this so-called artistic algorithm that generates the work in real time to reframe social media as this kind of data-driven, ready-made uh, uh, ready work of art. Uh, and the videos in this were obtained without Vine's permission. So I didn't actually go and ask them permission. I, I got them kind of through a slightly back door. Uh, so this algorithmic process separates the video performances from the original context, uh, from the flow of Vine conversations, the responses, the hashtags, all the, all the perceived ephemerality that goes with that. Uh, and, and that reflects the state of the internet as a data repository that can be algorithmically sliced up any which way. Data are data after all. And in this context, the interface is key. It gives meaning to data. It serves to lock it down by limiting access to users, who after all are its, are its creators. And then it packages it in unseen ways for advertisers and for other purposes. Uh, so what I, what I, to conclude, I will say that data art, as I see it, has the potential to develop artistic counter practices uh, and that these can help shape our understandings of data technologies 
uh, and through this shape their meaning and how they are enacted in the world in a form of uh, imminent critique. Critical data art, I would argue, not only plays a critical role in uncovering the workings of these black box systems and opening them to public scrutiny, but it has an agency in shaping our understanding of data uh, and the technologies that use it, how they come to be enacted in the world and their broader societal impact. Uh, and uh, that's all I have. I'll leave it at that and uh, hand back to Chris. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Uh, thanks very much, Connor. And as mentioned, we'll come back to you for a more of a, a general discussion afterwards. So I'm going to hold my questions in, in reserve for, for later on. Um, next up, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Kieran Nolan. Um, Kieran is a artist researcher, indie game designer and academic. He's a lecturer in creative media at Dundalk Institute of Technology and co-director of DKIT's Creative Arts Research Centre. Uh, Karen's interdisciplinary research explores the aesthetic, material, and connective properties of arcade video game interfaces through digital art, design critique, and platform histories. He holds a PhD in computer science, specializing in game studies and media art from Trinity College Dublin. And his work has been awarded by Leonardo, the International Society for the Arts, Sciences, and Technology, the Institute of Designers in Ireland, and IMIRT, the Irish Game Makers Association, and has been featured at exhibitions and conferences worldwide. So uh, welcome, Karen, and happy to hand over to you. Thanks very much, Chris, and hi, everybody. I hope you're all keeping well. I'll just do a, share my slides here with you. Very happy to be here today and to present my work, so hopefully it'll be of interest to you all. I'll go back to the beginning here. So as Chris said, my name's Kieran Nolan and I, yeah, I work in Dundalk Institute of Technology. I'm a lecturer there. And also we have the Creative Arts Research Centre at Dundalk Institute of Technology. I'm co-director there. And I'm going to take you through some work I've been doing the last few years, um, a couple of projects of which are featured in the book chapter. And this is this title of this talk, it kind of um, sums up what I've been working on the last, well, as part of the PhD, which I wrapped up a couple of years ago, but I'm, I'm continuing on in this um, team and vein. So it's really, yeah, I've been looking at arcade video games and how they can work as um, a medium by which to examine what they are themselves. So their self reflexivity of them. So a little bit, I guess, of background. Um, before I kind of went um, down the, the route of this, this particular set of projects and this area of study, I was from an interaction design background and graphic design background, so very much um, focused on, on the link between people and, and technology um, through the interface. And for my PhD study, I wanted to go um, in a little bit more left of field and you know look at the interface but not necessarily as in, in under like you know the kind of way of user experience and trying to make sure that's always a seamless link but more interrogating that link and looking at the tension between the real world and the digital world through different types of interfaces and also the interface um as defined by user context so if we look at what's on screen here you can see this is um the arcade interface from a few different angles. On the on the left, you have the type of mediums that were used to create arcade um, graphics and during the late 1980s, early 1990s. So at this time, there were no, um, the type of tool sets that they were using, they were built from scratch by the companies themselves. They were programming with machine code and every arcade um, hardware platform was a bespoke sort of a computing assemblage that was made for that task for that game or that series of games. So for me with this um, set of projects part of it was like find out what is the materiality of an arcade game? What is it? What is the stuff that's made of? What's that like to work with? And what is the arcade? Um, how does it move from platform to platform and f as a genre across um, different media, not just computational media. So you can see there the Chase HQ that's in that, the, on the top, you would see the original um, arcade version. 
but below is the ZX Spectrum version. So that was made totally, you know, in a manual process where the creators just studied it by eye and recreated it, um, you know, using their own, you own, own tool set for a completely different system, no access to code, no type of access to the, um, the source assets. So they had to give their own artistic impression of it and the type of manual interface and the type of screen that it was been experienced through that changed also so it's no longer the sit down arcade machine it's been played through a rubber keyed zx spectrum so through this set of um projects that i made they all fit together into this overall composite of the of the arcade uh, interface so control was the first of these and this focused on the on the screen and on the controls the Arcade Operator was the second project, and that was more about what's going on inside the machine. So Connor talked about the black box of these systems that are used to surveil us. I was looking at the black box of what goes on inside an arcade game that's designed for play-only use, but also is accessed at different levels, at design level, at technician level, by people with different levels of access. And the third project was VR Supergun, which is really looking at the shell of the machine and issues around its impermanence and entropy. So control was the first of the projects and it was really looking at the the link between game players and the game, that digital medium, through the link of the hand to game controller. So it's taking the most basic arcade interface of a joystick with one button and looking at that making that the focus of the game so like if you're looking at say trying to make the perfect interaction design it should be really seamless and you should forget that the interface is there but in this case i wanted to kind of go the opposite route and make the interface the sole focus of the game so the interface is in your face and it's you're seeing a mirror of your own actions on screen and the hand on screen, it's this down sampled representation of, of yourself, of your own hand, which, you know, is very complex and has, you have, has, you know, a level of manual dexterity that, you know, you see robotics trying to re recreate the human hand. It, it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated task. But this hand on screen, it's controlled with just up, down, left, right and one button. So that's used to move the hand around. And it's also used to um, press the buttons of the on-screen game controller. So they light up randomly. It's kind of like whack-a-mole. And um, each of the 10 levels are sort of like a potted history of game controllers. And you have 10, the first nine levels are based on regular game controllers that would be recognizable. Some a bit more obscure than others, but they're actual controllers that were out in the wild and, and would, were in the commercial space. The tenth level, however, is this image you see on the bottom left of the screen. And that was called the Octopad. So it was imagining if these game controllers could evolve themselves um, in complexity, um, where would they go? And there's kind of a critique built into that about the complexity of um, game controllers and how they've evolved to try and keep up with the specs of what's happening on screen. And sometimes there's always that issue there about like, you know, how, how to, um, make all the features accessible but not to bombard the user with too many things so the game itself um i submitted it to a, a, a number of um, different exhibitions and festivals and the nice thing about working with this one which was completely you know it was just an upload to dropbox the curators um would put their own finishing touches to how it was actually to be presented in the space. So that was like another layer then of the interface of the link between the people and the artifact that was out of my control. But it was really nice to see how different people, you know, made it fit for their space and how they made it work. So on the top right, you can see at Vector in Toronto, it was shown on screen on a flat, on a flat screen. And the controller was on a plinth, so the keyboard on a plinth and your hands are extended downwards and that affords a certain type of, of play. At Materiality in Galway, it was on a, a little CRT screen on the, on the floor, so you'd have to crouch down to get eye to eye level with it. And that adds maybe a little bit more attention. You can see it in the looping GIF there for the, they're using the 
Atari 2600 controller and then on screen you've also got the controller and it's a really tough game I mean the, the original arcade games are arcade games and generally compare them to console games console games will have an energy bar arcade games will have that, that's a little bit more forgiving arcade games it's like you know you're dead and that's it you have to pay to play so the learning curve is quite steep and you can see this gameplay session ends pretty quick for that guy but with some time and perseverance it is possible to beat it and i've seen people do it so it's it's out there it's, it's on itch.io if you want to download it and have a go um the second project i'm going to talk about um is arcade operator so this was sort of the sequel to control and this was looking at the arcade game um, or the arcade interface um, as defined by user context. So, you know, arcade games, they're designed for play only access, a lot like game consoles. And, you know, that was part of the reason I kind of went down this route. I was inspired by a lot of really interesting digital art that's made through game consoles and through closed off systems. And arcade systems were something I wanted to know a lot more, wanted to find out more about because, you know, a lot of kind of multimedia experiences that high-end multimedia experiences would have been delivered to people or experienced by people firstly through an amusement arcade a few years before home computers had caught up with that level at least up to around the up to the end of the 90s and at that point the consoles and the computers were beginning to catch up with what the arcades could do at least audio visually but yeah this game is about the operator level interface so about having to you know the repair and upkeep of arcade games and over the course of this um, research I, I interviewed people who were involved with arcade maintenance and also um, found out a lot more about what goes on behind the scenes but I was, saying, I was trying to take an a arcade interface convention like with the control project it was all about the joystick one single joystick and one button with this i made it two buttons with one joystick and i was adopting the the interface convention the control scheme of the arcade brawler so these beat em up games you might have seen double dragon or final fight where it scrolls from left to right and you have to fight your way past these different assailants and pick up energy along the way well, in this case we're taking that um that convention and mapping it to a non-play um, way of interfacing with arcades and then you know the project itself was me engaging with the arcade interface but through this um this art game angle as well so there's a few different layers there and the this project as well it's not not visible in what you can see here but i it also got me into the music side of things so design um composed a chip tune soundtrack for it with little sound dj on the nintendo game boy and that was an interesting journey into those type of audio audio constraints as well so these projects there are a lot of them a, a constant theme throughout all of them was the constraints the audio visual constraints and trying to work with those mostly visual but in this case the the audio as well with the soundtrack and trying to work within well, I wasn't using the same kind of development systems that were used in the 80s and 90s by our, the arcade designers there. I was trying to find a close enough approximation to them. So setting the low resolution and a low um, color palette um, was essential. And also the engine that was used to make these two games, it's called Stencil, it's tile-based. And while that was optimized, that tile-based, um, because it was mainly aimed at um, mobile platforms, this type of tile-based graphics would also be a hallmark of 80s and 90s arcade games. Um, and it's all got to do with memory constraints and being able to use those tiles in a kind of mosaic type form to save on memory and to work within the, the limitations of the platform. The final project I'll talk about very briefly, it's the kind of the final part of this trilogy. It's called VR Supergun. So this was going into the hardware side of things. And it was a super gun basically is the wiring of an arcade machine, but it's um, made into a console, game console type form. And they've been around since the nineties. The name actually came about when it's from a version of this type of device that was released from Hong Kong during the first Gulf War. And super gun was in the news a lot and they thought it sounded pretty cool. So that became, 
it's kind of like, you know, everyone calls a vacuum cleaner Hoover or some people do anyway. So the, the brand name became the name for the device in general use. So this was looking at the, well, the other two were art games built from scratch. This is more game art because I'm using um, a piece of arcade hardware um, and that was the JAMA interface um, or the JAMA Arcade Standard. So JAMA Arcade Standard was brought in in 1985. And while the actual computers of the games are changing constantly, this standard allowed these JAMA compliant boards to be swapped between machines um, that, that had carried that standard. So it meant that the arcade operators could save money and not have to keep replacing the entire cabinets. But it's, it's looking at the, um, the impermanence of the actual shell and issues around restoration and, and, um, and, and upkeep of these machines. So, you know, the actual outsides of them, they're made of either brittle plastic or chipboard, that, that particle board that breaks apart. So this was really trying to find a happy medium between emulation and um, the actual using the real hardware. So basically it allows you to play the real hardware, but through a VR front end. And the VR part is done in web VR. So web VR is quite low resolution and that kind of fit into the team. I, I did it in a, in a 90s graphics style, partly to keep it low resolution to fit within what can be done um, in web VR and also to match my own, my own 3D um, level. But that's, that project is still in active development and yeah, I have more documentation I can share with that if you like. But I think I'm getting near the end of my time limit. So I'll just say thanks very much to everyone. And yeah, if you want to find out more about the work, you can always ask me in the Q&A. You can also check out online as well. So thanks very much for your time and enjoy the, the rest of the talk session. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Karen. Uh, I'm also pleased to see from uh, the chat there a bit of a shout out to the ZX Spectrum. <laughs> so there are no excellent all out there, all right. Um, and for a final uh, presentation there, before we open up to a uh, discussion, I'm very pleased to welcome L. Putnam. Um, Elle is a lecturer in digital media at Uni National University of Ireland, Galway. She's an artist, philosopher, writer, working predominantly in performance art and digital technologies. And her work focuses on borders and entanglements of gesture, particularly the interplay of the corporeal with the machinic. Through her artistic practice, she explores hidden histories and emotional experiences, testing the limits of their unrepresentability. She holds a PhD from the Institute for Doctoral Studies in the Visual Arts, and her research focuses on continental aesthetic philosophy, performance studies, digital studies, and feminist theory. So welcome, Elle. Hi, thank you. And um, I just want to again thank uh, James for putting this book together um, because what I had done my research on here um, has kind of been, um, you know, it was a hunch of an idea when I started working on it. And it was something I was working on in my practice. But um, as time had progressed, um, it's extended and actually has become a kind of book in its own right. So that will hopefully be coming out next year. Uh, the first manuscript has just been sent off. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my contributions to the chapter and uh, specifically focusing on the aesthetics of interruptions, which was one of the key ideas to come out of this chapter. So I'm just going to... So this idea of an aesthetics of interruption, I began, you know, exploring it in my artistic work when I was pregnant with my first child in 2014. And I felt at this time um, to be, you know, both on display, but also how my subjectivity was being eroded to make room for my new status as a mother. And um, as a U.S. citizen, I had just moved to Ireland in 2013. And so it, it was also, you know, drawing a lot of these aspects of becoming a mother in a different cultural context. Uh, it brought a lot of this to the fore and realizing that there is a very particular uh, cultural and political history around motherhood here. 
and really experiencing that firsthand. Um, during this time, I was also interested in how Lisa Barrister describes the maternal subject as a subject of interruption. Quote, both she who is subjected to relentless interruption and she whom interruption enunciates, a subject that is who emerges from the experiences of interruption itself. And so here, it's not considering these interruptions to be aberrations as breaking this flow of experience, but how they become a kind of grounding for the subject. And as an artist working with digital technologies and a general interest in digital media, I came to realize uh, that this quality of interruption I experienced in my kind of early years of motherhood was parallel to the digital interruptions um, experiencing. And so trying to see how, you know, these two could be brought together. And through this process, um, I noticed that there were other Irish artists who were also working along these lines. So here is Irish artist Aideen Berry, whose work I discussed in the chapter. Uh, she creates these stop motion animations. Um, and in this particular piece, not to be known, you can see that she fuses her body with the materials of the home, uh, rendering this kind of phenomenology of the impossible. Um, what's striking about this work is there are quite visible gaps between the images. It gives it that kind of stop motion quality. But what is interesting me and interesting me and when I think about this aspect of interruption is that there's always um, a reference to something that exceeds the limits of representation. So it's always this, you know, the gap, um, the glitch and the lag, which I'm also going to discuss kind of points to the limits of digital technologies as a kind of quantifying technology to capture experience, but also thinking about the limits of idealizations of motherhood and how there is much of lived experience that kind of seeps over these limits. And seeing this, you know, Aideen's work, um, not just in the content of her work, but also in the stylistic quality of the gap. Uh, so in this particular video, uh, what she does is she's performing these kind of common domestic household labors of, um, you know, cleaning the home and preparing the family meal, but it becomes this destructive uh, frenzy. And the house itself is a mess and then going through and cooking this meal, it's just like, it's a monstrous scene. And, um, you know, it, it becomes this way of thinking the pristine household that's um, prized in this idealized version of domesticity. Um, and what she's doing this though, is she's controlling it all on her smartphone. So, you know, these kinds of references, they present what Rosemary Betterton refers to as an alternate, alternative visual geology of motherhood and how it's possible to trouble these idealizations of the maternal. And, um, so, you know, so that's one of the works and I consider it particularly in relation to um, the um, gap with Aideen's work, but also looking at um, the work of artist Laura O'Connor, whose piece, who, who's done a number of works um, using live streaming uh, performance works. And here's a piece that she presented in 2017, incorporating green screen and live streaming. Um, and here, thinking about the aesthetics of interruption in terms of the lag. So as you can see in this piece, um, she applies green uh, paint over her body. And as she's performing this piece in the live space, it's being streamed on YouTube while simultaneously being projected onto the wall. But there's a, a gap between, you know, the actual presentation of the action and when it's present. And so there is this kind of implication of um, difference in time that's experienced. Uh, again, pointing to the limits of representation. So the work here was created in response to the Citizens Assembly um, in 2017 that had suggested to repeal the Eighth Amendment. And it led to um, Irish politician saying how uh, it made him uncomfortable to think of abortion being put on demand. Uh, and so 
it becomes thinking about how women's bodies are being placed under erasure through this idealization of Mother Ireland and here uh, erasing her body as it's overlaid with the video of uh, the Irish Sea, which is the body of water that many women had to travel to attain legal abortions in, in England. And um, so what's interesting about this work and what I think about in the chapter and in my own practice is how artists can inhabit digital technologies um, and expose and uh, play with the apparatus, um, pointing to these qualities of the gap, the lag, and in my own work um, with the glitch, um, and thinking of this as a kind of imminence with technology. So in relation to my own work that I discuss, in the chapter. Um, the first one was rendered that I showed at the beginning and this one of uh, Fertile Ground. Um, and I'm just actually going to make sure this audio. Oh, no, you can't hear it. That's cool. Or are you hearing the audio of this? Um, hold on. No, okay, good. <laughs> Oops, wrong video. Uh, sorry, I'm having a little tech difficulty here. Okay. All right. Okay. Apologies. Okay, I've got that playing again. Um, so in this piece, um, it's using uh, lights that are connected to a motion sensor. And um, I try to stay as still as possible, but my gesture is being externalized through uh, the movement with the light here. And so again, thinking about how, you know, my body itself being made invisible, but the actions having further uh, present implications. Um, and then later in this piece, I, a video is played where I had glitched some images using pixel sorting algorithms. Uh, again, you know, pointing to the pixels that comprise images, but also to the limits of these images to represent motherhood and uh, the challenges of attaining these ideals. And so, you know, thinking about how, you know, Barry O'Connor and myself engage in this aesthetics of interruption, when we think about the formal qualities of the work, but also the aesthetics emerging from the mother as a subject of interruption. And these gaps, lags, and glitches, you know, it, it, it alludes to the absence and presence, so interrupting this kind of seamless flow of digital media. And just to end, um, so I'd been working on this, and again, I continued researching it, and it's kind of turned into a book um, that will be coming out next year. But um, during this time, you know, COVID-19 happens, and it kind of take some of these concepts relating the maternal, the domestic, uh, care taking duties and digital technologies. And it's really brought some, you know, concepts that it, it really uh, concentrated them and brought them to the fore, especially because many people like myself have been working from home with small children around and this uh, collapse of the domestic, the workplace, the education place. And um, so I just want to end with this short video that I made. Um, I don't think the audio is going to work, but um, just continuing to explore this idea in my practice. So, oops. Thank you.
That's great. Thank you very much, Joe. Um, and thanks everybody for uh, their presentations. Um, I'm going to welcome everybody back as well. So we're going to go on to our, our Zoom multi-screen format here now. Um, and I've seen some questions kind of uh, trickling in, but uh, first of all, I just want to say a big thanks to everybody for uh, some really illuminating um, and kind of fascinating uh, presentations um, and really kind of different approaches to, I guess, the ideas of kind of new media and how it kind of um, overlaps with artistic practices, but also with kind of notions of Irishness as well. Um, I've got a few questions here, if it's okay, that I might just take advantage of my privileged position as, a, as the moderator and throw a few ones out here just to get the ball rolling. Um, and I might just start with you, Connor. Um, you stated in your, in your essay uh, in, in the publication that while well, data are not neutral, they are also not predetermined. Uh, clearly, you see art and activism as ways of contesting the ubiquity of big tech. Uh, but for the casual user, um, like me, <laughs> are there means to achieve this without a background in programming? And I'm kind of thinking here of something I, I saw Richard Stallman give a talk about 10 years ago in the UK. And he was, he was really damning about, you know, companies like Apple coming in and giving free computers to schools and stuff um, as this kind of a philanthropic gesture, but obviously to to kind of condition people into using these these programs that can't be or these this hardware that can't be hacked into. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on you know, what tactics are available to these generation of digital natives whose understanding of the internet has been formed through existing uh, platforms and hardware. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it is difficult because. Uh, there is a dominance, uh, you know, kind of the marketplace dominance of the big players like Google, Apple, Facebook, and people like that. But I think, you know, at one level, at the level of privacy, it, there are things like, you know, we, we, can switch our, we can switch our browser, we can switch our search engine, we can, I recently, or about a year ago, I discovered that Google had a big list of everything I'd ever bought online. Even if it wasn't through Google, I never bought anything through Google. Uh, so I switched, I, I switched my email away from Google. Uh, I, I bought a, a privacy focus, you know, quite, quite reasonably priced, but I paid money for my email. And now I still have a Google email, but I, I hardly ever use it. So we can do things like that. We can, we can block, we can, you know, have a privacy focused browser, something like Brave or, you know, Firefox. Uh, we can use a different, we can use a different emails. And we can just be more conscious about that, even just changing our settings sometimes and moving away. Uh, the other thing we can do, I think, is to advocate, is to say that actually uh, we don't like the way things are being done uh, and uh, to actually use our, 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 our power as consumers and our power as, as citizens to say, okay, this is enough. We need to uh, bring some control back. Because I think one of the things with Silicon Valley is that they have convinced us that the way things are being done, uh, this, this idea of surveillance capitalism, where everything you do is being kind of uh, monitored uh, and uh, used to profile you to, to, at the moment, just sell you ads. Uh, that we can actually just, we can, we can just say, well, oh, we don't accept that. That actually we can have all the services and all the things we like about the digital economy, uh, but w w without this kind of erosion of privacy. Uh, so I think there is more, we have more power than we think. And I think uh, changing the behavior, we, we, we can change this. And that's at a kind of a, a regular level, not, not just a kind of a consumer level, uh, so to speak. Great, thank you. Um, El, I was really intrigued by your uh, discussion in, in your text and your presentation on this notion of the interruption as something that's applicable to, to motherhood and also to this, you know, to the digital uh, sphere. Um, and it actually, it really kind of made me think also of, of, of Legacy Russell's writing on glitch feminism. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote them here, which, where, where they talk about a glitch as a, a mode of non-performance, the failure to perform, an outright refusal, technology pushing back against the weighty onus of function. And so they apply this notion of the glitch as a disruption of the normative um, as pertaining to gender, race, sexuality. And I wonder, can you talk a little bit, expand about this idea of the liberatory nature of the glitch in relation to your practice? Um, how does uh, new media technology and its capacity to be uh, disrupted, hacked, glitched, offer a way to think beyond kind of heteronormative ideas of identity, including gender, uh, nationality, and especially, uh, specifically motherhood? 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. I'm glad you mentioned Legacy Russell because uh, I actually had the honor of being on a panel with them back in February and I used their work in the forthcoming book where I talk more about glitch um, because the thing that's really striking about Legacy's approach is um, they talk about this uh, breaking of the online offline loop. And so getting away from this notion of being, you know, in real life versus virtual to being just away from keyboard. And that's something also that, that kind of, so it's not just about glitching the body on the screen, but glitching the body in general. And um, uh, specifically in, um, or no, I won't talk about that now. <laughs> but um, no, I found that that approach to glitch has been very useful because it's a way of not only you know, drawing attention to the political potential of glitch. I know there has been some critique on this uh, because the glitch itself is not inherently critical. Uh, it's become quite stylized. I mean, now you can see loads of apps and other, like it's very easy to make uh, glitches. Uh, it's, it's commonly a filter that's used on, on things like TikTok <laughs> and everything. And, uh, but it, it doesn't mean that we can re you know, reject the possibility of glitches here. And so I see Legacy's work really extending these critical possibilities to not just thinking about what we see on screen, but when we glitch our bodies. Um, so yeah, no, it's, it's fantastic work. But also I think it's, it's kind of interesting from you know, the kind of spectatorial kind of perspective as well, that you know, when you see it's something glitch, regardless of its aestheticization, uh, you see something as being wrong, something going wrong. So it kind of, you know, it infers this kind of sense of, oh, there's like a, a, a problem happening here. Um, and it does, mm -hmm. you know, institute a sense of kind of, you know, critical reflexive, reflexivity, I think, through that. Yeah, actually, just to follow up the way I, um, in the book that's going to be forthcoming on this topic, I talk about glitch feminism in relation to transmasculine pregnancy. So thinking about how um, you know people who have transitioned to male and then are retaining female anatomy to give birth, and this becomes an instance of glitching the body, where it's not um, it's not considered you know something to be abnormal or something that's broken, but really is extending the possibility of care and reproduction. Wonderful, um, Kieran. Um, I know I've got loads of chats, got like loads of chat comments in here coming in as well. Um, uh, I think people kind of reliving some of the technology of, uh, of the, the 80s. I think uh, as a, a fellow child of the 80s, I, I think I spent a lot, a lot of time in video game arcades and shopping malls. Um, but I wanted to ask you something specifically about the, the piece you did, uh, Control. And again, I'm going to quote you back here where uh, you say that in Control, the visual interface will not let you forget that you're manually interfacing with the computer through a handy controller link. And as you mentioned in, this, in your essay, this notion of medium specificity in video games um, is kind of an essential aspect of artistic development, a means of figuring out the essentials of the medium in question. Uh, can you elaborate a, a little bit maybe on this notion of video games as an artistic medium? Um, and also maybe what obstacles you've encountered in transferring this medium to uh, not just a gallery setting, but to kind of a context, to an uh, understanding of of what it means to um, explore kind of gaming um, through this kind of aesthetic lens. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Um, okay. So, I guess like when I started off, kind of on the on the journey of of doing those projects and and the thesis around them, it was really yeah trying to find out what is the what is the stuff, what is the material of of an arcade game, and like I said. Um, in, in earlier saw a lot of great examples there are, are a lot of brilliant examples out there of people taking closed off um computer systems and and you know using them like programming for systems that weren't designed meant to be programmed for by the public like say making homebrew console um console games or you know taking a console and you know rewiring it into circuit bending it so that it creates its own kind of new visuals through a kind of a trial and error kind of a broken glitch process and um but like an important part of it for me was setting constraints um because like you look at what a modern pc can do what a, what a phone can do okay as, as a multimedia um 
device, you have a massive color palette, lots of processing power. You can, you know, it really is the Swiss, the Swiss army knife. Um, but the creators of these games in the 70s, 80s, 90s in particular, they had far tighter constraints. And um, I couldn't replicate those exactly, but um, I, I attempted to use altering like software that, you know, like say for the two, 2D games, they were using tile-based software, um, which was kind of matched the tile-based graphics of well, production processes of, the, of, of those games from that, from that era. But um, like one thing I found was that like, you know, the kind of the, say like, you know, if you want to go down that route, um, there is no set medium. I mean, the people who are making games the for in the commercial context in the 80s and 90s for the arcades, they were, it was all, it was all their own tools. They were working with really kind of computers very much as a raw material, like they were building their own computers and then doing their own code that wasn't just like they had like say can have Unity now and design a game in Unity and just export it out for every platform. They would design like a computer, it would have a Z80 processor, they'd have to do Z80 machine code for that, it would have a certain type of memory unit, they'd have to have machine code precisely for that. So it was really... Um, they they had this kind of hacker mentality for this for this um medium that was to the end end user it looked like something that was very um polished and it was mass produced and everything but it was the story behind it it's it's a lot it's a lot more rough around the edges and a lot of improvisation and um if you like looking at the kind of the the studios that they're working in. One the first slide I had, like that was, you could see this graphics workstation and there was a joystick. So they were making their own controllers for making games, for, for designing the graphics for arcade games out of repurposed arcade machines. So like there was a game, Quicks, that didn't sell very well. So I think it was Taito. So they um, took that game and they those unsold arcade machines and they turned them into graphics development workstations. So I might have gone a little bit tangent there, but as far as the challenges of doing it my, myself, I mean, like each of those projects, there was loads and loads of speed bumps along the way. But the thing was, I just um, like say, there was, especially I think with the second project, for some reason, the arcade operator one, it was, it was done in a package that wasn't really designed for doing that type genre of games. And I just hit a lot of speed bumps with it. And um, it got there eventually, but yeah, I mean, it was all a lesson in constraints and I guess it's, it's good for the soul, you know, to adapt to work around these things. And it's a, it's, it's a challenge and the challenge was part of, of, of it as well. So. Well, I think you have actually um, responded quite well. And it actually kind of brings me a little bit back around what I had originally said as to Connor about this idea of like, you know, the, the, the idea of kind of programming and kind of hacking as being so integral to new media art. And we even think of the transition from kind of, you know, net art and, and those kind of practitioners to post-internet art where, you know, usually, you know, people are often kind of using platforms. They're not getting into the code. Um, so it's kind of fascinating to kind of see that that is a, a stage, I think, that any artistic medium needs to go through, that kind of process of kind of you know, getting in there and figuring out exactly what it can do. Um, and to kind of retain a little bit of that, as, of that as well, to kind of, you know, to, to leave a little bit of political agency, I guess, in the way you work. Um, I am going to um, throw out a few questions from um, our audiences here as well, because, you know, I could obviously monopolize this myself. Um, and I'm going to start with a question for, for Connor here from Eleanor, who says, uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, you mentioned how Irish user data is being sent back to Silicon Valley. And certainly I noticed that through social media and memes, American culture and language is seeping into Irish culture and language. Um, I was wondering, would you be able to talk a little bit more about this Americanizing in Ireland and could it be considered an aspect of American imperialism? Thanks. Wow. Uh, well, I think there's probably two, two parts to that because the, the first is the one on the, the data uh, and there is a whole idea of, you know, data colonialism has, has, has been quite, quite well theorized. But that's an, that's an interesting one because of the, the there was an agreement originally called Safe Harbor, 
that allowed for European data to be moved to American servers. Uh, and then that, that fell after a challenge by uh, uh, an Austrian student called Max Schrems, who was actually working in, who was studying in Dublin. And he sued the, the Data Protection Commissioner and they brought it to European court. And that fell. So then they, they changed that to, uh, I think it was the, there was a privacy shield arrangement. Uh, and he, he further challenged that. And last year that also fell. So there's a very kind of murky area of whether uh, European data has to be stored in European data centers or whether it can be transferred to America. Now, whether if by storing in European data centers that are still owned by, uh, you know, American multinational companies, how, how private is that? That's, that's a whole other, uh, <laughs> there's a whole other can of worms. But yeah, there, there is this idea that yes, that the data has been aggregated, it's been moved to uh, headquarters in these kind of, uh, I guess, American, originally American companies, but now they're, 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 they're global companies really. And, you know, they're very prevalent in Ireland. You know, if you go down what we call the, the Silicon docks, uh, you know, we, we have the headquarter of every European country or every, of every uh, tech company, we have the European headquarters in Dublin more or less. And it's kind of a big area. The whole idea of American culture uh, and whether we, we have become too Americanized, uh, I'm not sure that's really a question about digital or the internet even, because that's always been here. You know, that's been going right back to, you know, the 1950s, people worried about, you know, cultural imperialism uh, with American culture coming over and American music and American dancing and presumably American morals. Uh, I think that's always been here, you know, I think culture is global. I think we will pick up things uh, from that will come from America and, you know, where will they come? A lot, a lot of, a, a lot of actually, you know, what we see as being American culture is actually black American culture, African American culture, but also that's a, that's a, I think when, particularly for Irish people, I think it goes the other way. I mean, I think Ireland is a country that has, you know, really strong culture and, it, that that spreads around the world too, and there's little bits of Irishism. I, I lived in the states for a couple of years, and there's a lot of like Irish things that that float around in, in American culture, in English culture, uh, generally around. So I think that's a kind of a give and take. Uh, uh, it's not something I particularly worry about. The it's, data is another one, though. It was something um, I was kind of curious about. I think when you know when I was first talking to James about the publication. And to kind of say, well, you know, I, you know digital art in Ireland, of course, you, you tend to think when you think digitally, is I, I tend not to think nationally, um, that part of the whole promise of the internet, whatever you think about it, I know it's a different thing when it comes to infrastructure and stuff like that, but it, is that you kind of think, oh, well, why, why should there be kind of a national character uh, to kind of digital art in some kind of way? Um, and obviously, that's probably the way you're encouraged to think in kind of a, a neoliberal kind of uh, uh, sensibility, but um, at the same time, it's kind of something to kind of work through and maybe the eclecticism of some of the presentations and some of the essays actually kind of demonstrates that kind of tension between kind of national and global kind of identities, I think. Um, I have a question here for Karen, or all, and actually I think, you know, with any of these questions, please feel free to kind of jump in. I'm kind of happy to kind of have a more open conversation here. Uh, who asks, uh, do you feel the work present, re sorry, do you feel the work presented today represents the artistic relativism rather than universal standards in Irish digital art. And where do you see universal standards best represented in Irish digital art? I'm not sure my work is like, everybody's got their own different thing that they're doing. I'd say mine isn't really, I'm, I'm not too sure if it's like, a, if it's like, you could say it's Irish in particular, you know, it's, it's, it's a piece, it's more, it's not really geographic or region specific. It's more about, um, it's more time specific really, because it was focused on a particular, you know, few decades of, of, of like a medium, the arcade medium, and then, you know, interrogating it and seeing what I could do with those constraints. Um, also, like you mentioned a moment ago, um, you know what why can find why can find things to Ireland. I mean, one of the things the last few years, and it's it's great, like you know, through the internet you can like, okay, we're doing this Zoom talk now, we're all in different parts of the country, but been able to participate in 
in events worldwide. Like once I haven't actually physically been at, but could just, you know, email or send my work through an online drive and it's it's shown over there. And, you know, I'm, 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 I'm kind of watching living vicariously through social media, um, looking for, you know, checking it out and, and, and engaging people's reactions to it. So I think like, not sure if I'm answering the, if I'm answering exactly as the, as, as wanted, but it's really, I'd see Irish digital art. Yeah. Like, you know, we, like my work, I can't say it's particularly Irish. It's like I said, it, it's, it's, it's more of a, a worldwide, um, kind of, um, digital culture thing or a specific area of that from a specific time. Um, and yeah, we have, we have great, we have the ability to, to reach out over, over abroad, um, over the sea as well. So, I mean, why not, why not use that? Um, I have a question here, which is more of a general question, but actually I might direct this to you, El. Um, I'm aware that, of course, three of you are all artists with very different practices. Um, but so, you know, all of you obviously are, are free to kind of jump in here, but this is Eleanor asking, um, you know, or, or first of all saying, I often think that artists are quite slow to pick up on new technologies in their work and work that does use new technology, like VR, for example, often seems to be lauded for the novelty of the technology over the effectiveness of the work's message. Now certainly, then she says, how do you think this can be overcome? And I just think about this in relation to your practice, Earl, because obviously technology is part of it, um, and you're exploring the kind of, uh, you know, the essentials of that technology. But of course, message is kind of predominant in, in that as well. And um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that kind of, that tension of kind of, you know, working with something which maybe its immediate impact tends to be, well, this is kind of, you know, quite high tech, or this is quite kind of cutting edge. Um, we're still kind of being able to kind of communicate or retain kind of a, uh, an underlying message. I guess I'd first start by saying that I don't, I don't think it's that artists are slow to use tech. In fact, a lot of artists are involved in the innovations of technology. Uh, thinking of artists involved at MIT and Xerox, uh, with Bell Labs and EAT, uh, also at the Banff Center in Canada. There's a lot of times artists work enable us to think about these technologies as they develop and use them in ways that lead to innovation. So I think what is I see more often is um, artist, uh, art galleries context for presentation of work. Um, it's, you know, and it's because it, it may be there's certain technical specificities. It could be the ubiquity of digital technologies within our lives and then how to consider that as an artwork. But I, I, I think it's a more complex scenario um, there. Um, and I guess, you know, the challenges, actually the challenges I face is getting work exhibited. So it's not been so much the production of it, but um, you know, finding ways to present and exhibit it. And um, I, I guess, Connor, you might be able to jump in here. I know because we've had lots we've had lots of conversations about this over the years. <laughs> uh, yeah, abs absolutely. Uh, I think as well, but I think things are changing. I, I think this. Uh, I had an interesting experience a few years back when we had a, a kind of a prominent uh, Irish artist coming to do a talk, and it, it was great. We were setting it up, and then uh, there was an ad going to go into Eflux about it. Someone, I think we were, we were doing it with Trinity College and they obviously had deep pockets to buy an ad in, in, in Eflux. Uh, and in the description, someone wrote that uh, this artist, and I won't mention their name, uh, was a digital artist. <laughs> and, and everything was going smoothly up to that point. And he said, no, 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 don't, don't, don't put in digital artists, just say artist. Uh, and even at that point, even at that quite, you know, a kind of a, an international, you know, high achieving international artist, they didn't necessarily want the term digital to be attached to them. But, but I think at the moment we're, when we look at a kind of a, a new generation of like, and I'm talking about international artists that you might see at, you know, the Venice Biennale or something like that. Uh, there, practically everyone is working some way with digital tools because that's the kind of culture we're in. We, you know, digital is so ingrained in our everyday lives that we can't really say it's separated in the way that, you know, we don't talk about, you know, going into cyberspace when we, you know, do something on the internet anymore like we used to. Uh, so I think, you know, the, 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 
naming it digital art is somehow separate it is is saying that it's separate somehow to you know regular art or non-digital art or, or even proper art uh, so i think those things are falling away and i think there's a whole new generation of artists who don't you know get hung up on the descriptors and i think that's very useful because i think you know what what is digital what is not digital anymore i think it's kind of uh, it, it's very much blending i mean this maybe goes back to, to something i was saying there as well and um about this idea of this kind of, um, I can't remember the, the author who spoke about it, but the kind of collapse or the kind of not having a differentiation between, you know, in real life and, uh, or, or AFK <laughs> away from keyboard um, and, and the online thing. And, and, but I always wonder because, you know, I, I, I used to, I, I, I spent several years working at Corner House in Manchester, which was very much at the time with Fact in Liverpool was, you know, it was a new media digital art gallery. Um, and certainly a few years back when you had a lot of the kind of commotion about kind of post-internet art and kind of great swathe of, uh, of artists who go, oh, my, my work is all about the internet and stuff. There was a sense that, you know, that there were histories that were being erased and overlooked there, that some of the practitioners who came out of that kind of hacking background, who came out of kind of uh, activism and the early days, the wild west of the internet, um, had been kind of written out of out of that process to get there. And I wonder if that's a concern for, for, for any of you as well, that, you know, that in a sense is kind of a uh, takeover of, uh, of kind of digital culture by contemporary artists of, of all ilk um, is actually um, not kind of really kind of paying due to some of the, kind of the more difficult kind of stages that, uh, that, that artists had to go through to get to that point. Actually, if I could just jump in here, um because I do in the chapter, I talk, I connect the work um, to uh, work by like Pauline Cummins and artists that are working in video with performance. And I think there is a strong legacy there. I also see connections to artists like Joan Jonas and Martha Rossler. And I think it's important to acknowledge these legacies and to have a kind of digital, non-digital, when really it is a longer history of working with technologies and tools, but we could even consider a paintbrush a kind of technology. I think it's what's great about when Lev Manovich talked about the, the language of new media that he kind of started with Ziga Vertov. <laughs> I was like, yes, it's like that was a media, that was a new media at its time, of course, as well. Um, I've got a question here, which I'm almost afraid to ask it, um, but it's, uh, would any of you like to address the current craze controversy over, and you knew it was coming, uh, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, uh, the Bitcoin art thing, um, any comments or thoughts about uh, the new, the new hype and the new kind of rage around this, uh, this medium? Such a fast moving area. Um, no, sorry, I was just going to say it's such a fast moving area. So much has happened the last month or so. I mean, who needs Netflix? There's so much drama. Just follow NFTs on Twitter and there's lots of entertainment there kind of, um, seen and well, looking there yesterday and you know there seems to be a lot of kind of trolling of nfts sort of um of the nft scene by um um by i guess like there's uh, there's two sides it's like you know okay you've, you've made an nft you're going to you're burning down the planet you're the worst human being and then there's the um but then and you've got people who've made life-changing amounts of capital whether that not a, that's a good or bad thing that's another issue i mean even you read about people um there's a whole lot of very interesting stories going on there and then you have the um the ethical nft so like there's i can't i can't pronounce the name right but there's a there's a service and it's latin for here and now and it uses um if you look up clean nft or um ethical nft and basically it's it it's actually looks it looks really exciting because it's more like a a new type of portfolio or curation space and there's low 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 stakes currency but lots of really interesting um creative stuff so anyway i i think it's i think it's really interesting um it's like i said it's all happening really fast but i'm sure the other panelists have their own views in it well uh, as well so respect that Yeah, I mean, if I can jump in, I mean, uh, yeah, I've been following it too, and it, it's been super interesting. But I think you have to kind of divide it into two, perhaps, in that there's the, you know, the, the kind of the big ticket sale items, 
where people have been selling stuff for you know millions and millions uh and I, I kind of put that more into kind of cryptocurrency speculation and that if you look who's who's buying that they tend to be pe people who who are speculating in other cryptocurrencies and, and there's so many now and when you think that you know uh, Bitcoin has gone up, what, uh, tenfold in the last year? Uh, Ethereum, something similar. So there's been vast fortunes made. And if you got in early enough, you know, it's the old thing that if you put in a, a hundred euros, it would be worth, what, is, is this, is it a million now? Two million, five million? Depends when you put it in. It could be even more. Uh, so there was a lot of money made uh, on speculation in cryptocurrencies and, you know, crypto coins and all this kind of stuff. And I think to a certain extent, NFTs are, are, or nifties as they call them, are something similar to that. Like a lot of the big money is people hoping that the market's gonna rise uh, and they're, they're speculating. It's not as much about art, but about just a kind of a, an alternative asset, a financial asset. But you know, that's always also in the art world, you know? There's free ports, there's, there's people speculating in, uh, you know, buying art and selling art as an asset, as a financial asset buying shares in it, buying investment funds, all that kind of thing. So it's, it's always been part of the art world. But I think as Karen says, yeah, there, there, is, there is a whole other side to this. But, and I think that's quite interesting is that there is a way, we're, and whether it works out, I'm not sure. But, but there is a way to see that, 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 that artists can get paid for their work in a way that kind of maybe jumps through the whole kind of gallery system and the gatekeepers. Uh, and that has a more kind of direct connection to uh, to the audience, uh, and there's a way of kind of authenticating through you know through a system of kind of uh, uh, decentralized authentication that you can say this work is yours, it, w it was bought, and you can you can buy and sell without having to to go through you know commercial galleries and whole kind of art world. But I think it is, it is very much, you know, the, 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 the proof of uh, work, which is the, the, the main ones that go through Ethereum, they are burning the planet there. You know, each transaction is the same electricity consumption as something like two and a half days of American, an American house, which is a lot. Uh, whereas the other one, there, the, but there is an alternative system. And I think if we can switch to that, there may be something that, that actually adds sustainability and a kind of a source of, a source of earning money to artists, which I think is really important too. So it's important not to throw out, you know, everything just because, you know, there, uh, you know, there's a certain amount of, you know, I, I guess finger pointing at this, which I think is, is, is the, the carbon footprint to these is completely unsustainable. But we're seeing a lot of these artists then saying, but what about, you know, the art world? What about the carbon footprint of, you know, exhibitions of uh, curators flying around the world, you know, 300 days a year? What about the, the carbon footprint of shipping stuff? So there's a, there's a whole lot of whataboutism going on. But I think there's, there's something there and whether it comes out, I mean, I, I think it could be something very sustainable for artists that artists can actually get paid in a way outside of the kind of the, the gallery or the, the kind of the gallery uh, art dealers uh, auction house system. I think that would be really positive, particularly for, for kind of younger artists and maybe lesser known artists. No, I can't. Um, I think Connor and Karen did a great job articulating a lot of the key points and ideas. I do think it's kind of too early to uh, see where this lands us. I mean, I, I, I share the same hopes as Connor for the possibility of um, you know, finding other ways to share, distribute, and present digital work, which, you know, right now, like, the main option, if you could put it online, goes to social media platforms, and the money then goes to these platforms. So uh, it'll be interesting to see the implications. Uh, I did find out today that the uh, the Leave Britney Alone video from um, had sold for forty five thousand um, dollars for an NFT. So we're also seeing aspects of digital culture. Um, I know one of the early cam girls, Anna Voog, is selling her old stills with NFTs. So it's I think there's another implication here of digital culture, which has a lot of appropriation evolved to it. And um, I think that's an area that, that's going to be, again, it, it goes back to the longer aspect of working in art and appropriation, but uh, this is, this is um, added another twist to the story. 
Um, I think I've got time for um, probably one last or, or two last questions. We'll see how it goes. Because uh, there's another one kind of directed to everybody um, from Samir who asks, uh, have the panelists got any advice for art practitioners working in non-digital art and wanting to make the, a transition to digital art? Uh, how can one start seeing one's own work differently? I kind of like that last question there. Um, um, how to kind of move into this sphere um, if you're somebody who's maybe coming at from a, a very different, um, a different background? Uh, I'll come in on that. Uh, I think, yeah, what a great question, because uh, I, I think rather than thinking of the two of them as kind of opposed to each other, I, I think, and this is what one thing that's interesting with the NFT is the way people have kind of moved all sorts of different art practices and made it into this kind of token thing. But I think there's ways of like, whatever it is that you do, there's ways of kind of adding something digital to it or presenting it in a different way. And it depends where, where you're coming from. I mean, maybe if you're kind of an oil painter, it's, it's hard to do that. But then uh, I think, you know, we mentioned post-internet art earlier, you know, and there was a lot of oil paintings made of the internet. <laughs> and again, and is that a digital artwork? Is it a physical artwork? I, I think it's, you know, it can be both. So I think, you know, it's how do you, how do you extend your practice into something that maybe is, maybe has a kind of online presence. I think we've all been doing that over the last year, whether we like it or not. Uh, and to, to consider, you know, how the themes in your work, uh, how, how does that, you know, how does that connect to, to the world we live in? And the world we live in is increasingly, you know, or not increasingly, it is a digital world. Everything we do is kind of mediated somehow through digital technologies. And I think, you know, integrating that, but, but thinking less maybe about, you know, is this digital, is this analog, and thinking about how the two are meeting each other. So you know, is it is it you know is a drawing of something something on your phone? Is that a digital work? Is it an analog work? I can't say it's both. You know. I mean, this is it. Yeah. I mean, you could say anyone who's doing their research through the internet is, to some extent, employing uh, um, you know digital strategies as a way of kind of uh, creating the work, whatever medium they kind of use. Um, I do have one last one here. Um, I think I can kind of squeeze this in, which again is for for all of you. It's quite a broad one, but it's also uh, put to us by anonymous end attendee, which is, seems very, very appropriate for the Zoom conversation. Uh, what do you think current, the current age of digital art will have in terms of influence on art as a whole in the future? So what is the legacy that we're going to be looking at uh, for um, contemporary kind of new media digital art? I know this is a, a gigantic question and we probably got 10 minutes left of the, the panel, but um, any kind of thoughts of where you can see, I guess it's really kind of a future forecasting um, kind of question in a way, and what you see maybe on the horizon as having kind of potential for kind of informing artistic practices in terms of kind of digital technologies. I mean, I guess if I could just jump in, I guess my hope um, is for digital art to continue uh, to find ways to reveal and critique our technologies. I think that is one of the key things that art is enabling us to do at the moment. I mean, you know, e digital technology itself is such a, a vast thing. I mean, so is climate change. So is all these great things, but I think art here enables us to take it and present it in a way that's more manageable, understandable, and a little less overwhelming. And um, I mean, it, my fear though is, you know, with increased, um, as things are becoming more and more digital, tools are becoming harder to hack, technology is becoming tougher to, you know, engage with. I mean, you think about the limits of the Apple platform and trying to make any kind of modifications to it. Um, but that's why I think it's also important for artists to continue um, to work with these tools and take into account their material aspects, um, treating them like a medium. I, I know Hugh McCabe made the comment uh, the importance of creative coding and processing P5. Um, it's nice because it enables you to learn how the code works. Um, and it's, it's just, um, I do hope that we are not just the Cassandras. <laughs> and Kieran or Connor, any thoughts on uh, what could be on the horizon here? What yeah. is I suppose like, yeah, the question like asked about like contemporary art, I mean, how do we, 
put a time frame on contemporary. I mean, this whole NFT thing we just talked about, that's like blowing up so quickly. I mean, I know it's been around a few years, but like something like that, and maybe it's just because of money, suddenly people start going, oh, digital art, it's art, you know, it's important. And like, I think just, you know, the whole, I think it was mentioned earlier on about like, you know, people, I think Connor mentioned about like, you know, an artist and they're introducing them when it mentioned it was digital, like, you know, um, there's, I think just any kind of, Word, stigma if that's maybe that's the wrong word but you know you think about say music production you know um, music production maybe the last 20 years um you know gradually it moved to like you know computer-based tools you have people are real say zealots about like you know using certain equipment and i think that just you know over time and over it, it just kind of dissolves and it's the same thing with digital art too i mean it's just um it's art. I mean, like the whole tangibility thing, I suppose the NFTs are a kind of a solution that, but then there's loads of challenges there as well. And maybe that's one of the things about like, but it's also one of the unique things about like, you know, digi digital um, media is that it's, you know, it has that kind of um, non corporeal type element. It's, and that's, that's what's, you know, so, so much great digital art is about that. But yeah, I mean, um, I'm I'm looking forward to loads of interest in new things that we we can't even imagine yet. So we'll see where it goes. Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot I can add to that really, but uh, I think there is one thing though to say that that you know, in term, digital art has kind of the continuum between you know what is contemporary art, what is contemporary digital art. I think is quite small now. I mean, I think it's it's been integrated into a huge range of art practices. You know, some of them material, some of them uh, less material or immaterial even. But we also have to think going back. You know, someone like Robert Reichenberg spent you know a good portion of his time in the nineteen sixties and nineteen seventies working with art and technology and the experiments with art and technology. It's kind of been written out of his history to a certain extent when you see, you know, and we know him as a sculptor, we know him as a printmaker, painter, but he spent a lot, an awful lot at the, you know, at the kind of height of his fame and the height of his, I guess, influence. He spent a lot of time working with technology, working with scientists, working with technologists, engineers, uh, to kind of, because he saw it as technology as kind of the defining thing of his age. And, and I think the digital is probably the, the defining characteristic of our age. So I think, you know, again, not, not, to, not to kind of put the kiwash on digital art in Ireland, uh, I, I think, you know, are, can we say that all oral art is now somehow digital and that those kind of the, the intertwining of, you know, the kind of the traditions of, of contemporary, of, of fine art, contemporary art, and, you know, the traditions of digital art, and as they've come together in the last kind of, I guess, the last decade. There's really interesting things happening. I think that will continue to, to happen too. Um, I think that's a really wonderful note to, uh, to end on. Um, I just want to say a big thanks to, um, to all you guys, uh, to Elle, to Karen, to Connor, um, for your contributions and fantastic discussion and presentations, and for your fantastic uh, contributions to the publication as well. Um, and a big thanks, of course, to James O'Sullivan for putting together the, the, uh, this book. And of course, to Sample Studios and UCC's Department of Digital, Digital Arts and Humanities for the invitation to come here today. So uh, thank you very much. Yeah. And can we say a big thank you to everyone who, uh, who turned up? Uh, it's a fantastic turnout. And we know we're all kind of screened out. So thank you very much. And thank you for all the questions. But we, we didn't get to answer them all. So. Yeah, there was tons. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye.